Here we go, Philippians chapter two. Uh, we're gonna be in Philippians, no, no, we're gonna be Second Timothy, Hebrews, and First Corinthians. So in Second Timothy, uh, chapter one, uh, but while you're, you're perusing there and trying to find that in your app or wherever, uh, let me just say this, note takers are history makers. How many history makers do we have in the building? All right, that's like the weakest applause. That's the weakest like engagement. You're, I know you're trying to like shout and look for a second Timothy, but how many history makers do we have in the building? Come on, you're gonna make history. Second Timothy one says, I remember, verse five, I remember your genuine faith. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. Understand the context of second Timothy so you can, you can understand what's really happening. In first Timothy, Paul writes uh, a letter to Timothy and he sends it to him. And, and, and what's happening in the church is the church is just blowing up now in a good way. I mean, it is growing. I mean, if you look around you, ocean way is growing. God is doing greater things. And he tells him, he does, you need organization. So he writes him this letter and stretch and, and just organizes the church church in a way and structures it in a way that everybody's needs can be met and that people can be encouraged. And, and he does that. But then in second Timothy, uh, Timothy has a challenge and the challenge is the world wants to take out the church and they want to destroy the church. And there's people in the church that are zealots. Hello. They want to, they want to pick up their sword and they want to go fight the people in, in their own way because they're people of faith. And Paul talks to him about fighting the good fight of faith. But in the very beginning of this, this passage of this chapter in verse five of, of, of chapter one, he says, I remember your genuine faith for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Doesn't that, doesn't that speak generationally that, that this young man's faith was impacted from grandma to mom. And now Paul recognizes it and he says this, and I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you, come on, I'm here today to remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the laying on of hands for God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love. This is the big one, self-control, self-discipline. God's given you a mind that is disciplined. God's given you a mind that you can put control on so that you can grow in your faith. He says, I want to remind you to, to fan the flame or to stir up the gift that is in you. I'm just here to remind you that when God spoke to me about this series of message about living in the moment, that it is time as a community of faith that we pick up the pace that we start running at a greater pace, that we start leaning into his presence and saying, God, I'm gonna move with you in a greater way. I'm not gonna sit back and wait and settle and watch this thing. God, I wanna be a part of where you're moving. How many wanna be a part of where God's moving? So we dump down to Hebrews. We've been staying in Hebrews. I could preach out of Hebrews chapter 12, the verse two, two verses for the next several months. But in verse one, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, we've been reading this, Paul speaks to the church and he says, do you not know that, that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. At the gate river run, I, I think everybody's running at so many different paces. Guess what? I'm not a runner. I don't wanna be a runner. I despise running. I think there's a good thing about getting in a motorized vehicle and moving from one destination to another. Hello, who's with me on my, come on, clap with me. Come on now. My doctor says, Hey, what, what car do you, you doing? None. He's like, you need to do something about that. I'm like, yes, I will, but I will not run. <laughs> come on now. He says this run in such a way as to get the prize. So our main thought, this entire, uh, series of talks is living in the moment is living where God is moving. So if I'm going to live in the moment, 
then I need to run in such a way that I, I, I persevere. Then I need to run in such a way that is patient. Then I need to look at the way I am running. And, and, and today I want you to examine a couple of things because, because a fresh pace will turn into a fresh race. Someone's kind of sat on the sidelines. We're like, man, people are running by us. We're like, man, things are happening in their lives. Why aren't it happening in my life? Maybe God wants you to pick up your pace. And when you pick up your pace, you start seeing things happen around. He wants you to move out of the space where you are occupying. That's what we're doing this week. When I declare a fast, I say, God, over this house, let's fast and let's lean in and let's see the power of the Holy Spirit come and save and deliver and heal and motivate us to be the church. How many want to be the church? Come on, clap. You want to be the church? So let's pray together of this word, Jesus, for the next few moments. Lord, I know you're here in this room and I know you're moving. God, I pray that you would encourage us, that you would instill within us, God, to pick up our pace, to examine our pace. God, that we would see where you are, are moving in our lives, God. And we wouldn't just see it, we would lean in and we would be a part of it, God. Have your way today. Speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate God's word today. All right. So I grew up in, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about where I grew up. I grew up in a city called Ormond by the sea. It's like Ormond beach. There's Daytona beach and there's Ormond beach. And then I grew up on the, they call it the North peninsula. It's a, it's like a five mile stretch of beach that, that is way up on the North coast of uh, Ormond. And um, when I grew up, there was this pier that was there. It's no longer there anymore. And right next to the pier was a large lifeguard tower. And next to the lifeguard tower was the only beach approach that you could drive up because back in the day, you could drive anywhere on the beach in, in Ormond and Flagler counties, all those counties. You could, Volusia County, you could drive all over the place. Now you can only drive in certain places down there. It's kind of like going out to the beach out there and you drive on there, but completely different because... Uh, people would get in their cars and drive like four miles up the beach and then the tide would come in and then they'd realize, okay, I'm, I'm way up here by the, the lifeguard tower. And they'd say, there's an approach up there. Now, when you, you talk about an approach, beach approach, this is not a normal beach approach. Okay. You didn't just like drive up and go, oh, it's nice and paved and I can get up to this, this, this beach approach. This thing was a mess. It went like straight, like, like it was steep. And, and as kids, we would sit there and we would watch the waves. And I grew up there and we would surf right next to the pier and they really didn't like where we surfed and the lifeguards would yell outs and everything. But the joy that we had many times was to watch people that would come up to the beach approach and say, I need to get off the beach because the tide is moving and I need to get up on the road. And I mean, it was full of ruts and everything. And you'd see people and it would be funny. You'd see people like, man, my, my goal is to accelerate as fast as I possibly, they would gun it like, Whoa, we were like, okay, here comes one. You'd watch them like, here they go. Ah, and then they would hit like the ruts and, and it would start shaking and guys like, ah, and then he would slow down and he would keep going. He would spin until he would completely be on the frame and we would stand there and laugh. As kids, you would laugh. You'd like, that's really, like, you are not equipped to go up that, that approach. I mean, you needed a four-wheel drive vehicle or something, and then some guy would drive by in his little Jeep and everything, and he wasn't jacked up or anything. It just had regular, like, like street tires on it, and he would just walk up and, and just go, do 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 walk by, drive right by him, and keep on and go up and over, and, and he would make it and, and walk by, and that person would be, we would help him, we would push the thing we would do everything we can why because we thought it was just a, a beautiful mess that people get into uh, when I talk about pace today I want you to know something it's not about how fast you run some of us want to run faster but it's about being equipped for the race it's about having the right people around you it's about having the right focus in, in why you do what you do as a person of faith when I talk about running, I want you to attach the word journey. I want you to attach the word drive to that, that running. So, so why do we run? How do we run? Who do we run with? Those type of things. Who's on my journey? Who's with me? Who's standing near me? Who's, who's encouraging me? Do I have a bunch of haters over here that when I get stuck, they laugh at me? Hello? Or do I have a bunch of people over here that when I get stuck, they come along and they pick me up and they move me up the hill and, and they get me out of the situation. See, there's always going to be haters in the race. There's always going to be haters that, that, that think you need to run their race. Can I set you free today? Stop running somebody else's race. The Bible says that the race is marked out for us. 
I'm, race, I'm marking out a race for us. It's called a refresh fast for the next seven days where it's say, let's run in this lane. But when it comes to life, you are not meant to run everybody's race. You're not meant to run my race. You're not meant to run my wife's race. You're not meant to run Pastor Jeremy's race. You are not meant to run um, um, Jim Deacon's race. Hello, come on now. You're not meant to run anybody. You're meant to run your race. So when we talk about your race, I want to encourage you today. I'm not here to, to I, I want you to leave this place encouraged, stirred up, ready to go. Let's go. You know what I'm saying? Because, because I, and, and if you start focusing on the negative aspects of your journey, then the negative aspects will keep you stuck where you used to be. But if you start focusing on the positive things that are surrounding you, then the things that are surrounding you will encourage you to keep moving in the right direction. God does not want your faith to stall. God does not want you to get stuck in your faith. He wants your faith to grow. And you have to put yourself in a rhythm where you can grow. So the simple question, so if pace is the way we move, the drive, the journey, the approach, the simple question is, who am I running with? A fresh pace for a fresh race has to look at who we are running with. Now, if I'm running with the wrong crowd, then the wrong crowd will take me to the wrong place. That's just real simple to, to, to think about. But if I'm in a community like this and I have that, that nudge that, okay, I need that nudge. Have you ever need that nudge before? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just needed that. Like, I just need to push a little bit. To, I just need someone to encourage me a little bit. That's why we asked um, you to text 21 days to the number on the screen. They'll put it on the screen for you. Um, 21 days to 904-751-0552. And at eight, if you text this number at, at eight o'clock in the morning, you'll get a text from me. It's a personal text. And the text simply says, God, where are you moving? And how can I be a part of that? And then I usually add something to it. And today I, I put in there like, your, your refreshing is today, starts today. If you got that text, it starts today. There's almost 170 of you that have signed up for it. And, and I would encourage you, if, if you, you are with me, go ahead and text that. You know, like the next seven days, you need the nudge, like I need the nudge to look and to lean in those types of things. You'll get a, you'll get a text, eight o'clock in the morning. You may be at work, you may be on your way to work. You may be stuck in that, 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 that line, that school line. You know what I'm saying? That, that one on New Berlin, man, that thing is long. Hello? I mean, I went all the way around this week on Monday and I'm I'm like, wow, that thing went all the way back to Yellow Bluff. I'm like, them poor parents. I'm, I'm going around them people. Hello? So, yeah, you're being held hostage by the, by the elementary school. Hello? Here we go. So uh, ask yourself, who am I running with? If you do this, you text this number, you're nudging yourself saying, I want to run where God wants me to run. I want to see where he's moving. And when you see where he's moving, don't avoid it. Maybe you might need to pray for somebody this week at work. You might need to invite somebody to church this week. You may need to do something kind to your neighbor, the guy that's not very kind to you. Whoo, boy, that's good. Huh? You may need to you may need to pick up the phone. This is hard. You may pick up the phone and call somebody that that you've held a grudge against, that you have been bitter against, that they have hurt you. And you're like, Pastor, you don't know what they they did to me. I don't, but I do know that this word says to forgive, and you shall be forgiven. So if I want to apply the gospel to my life, then, then God can move in that situation. If, if God like, like tugs at your heart this week in those places, then, then I would encourage you to lean in and let God do something great um, in you and through you. So to so understand this, who am I running with? Let's look at this verse. I want you to see something super simple out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Because some of us, some of us hear this voice all the time. When it comes to spiritual things, we hear the voice in our head that says, you're in this all by yourself. You're alone in this journey, that nobody's surrounding you in this journey. But I want you to read verse 12 in a different way and notice where it says, he says, therefore, since we are surrounded, Paul didn't say, hey, since I'm surrounded, he says, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness. Then he says, let us, he doesn't say you, he says, let us. So I'm including myself in this. When we read this, he says, let us throw off everything that hinders it and, and everything or the sin that so easily entangles. Then he says, let us run out, run with perseverance, the race that is marked for who? For us. So when I realize that this is a corporate community, this is a, a not so much corporate, but this is a community of faith that, that God is speaking into 
and saying, together, let's throw off everything that hinders. Together, let's throw off the sin that entangles. Together, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You are surrounded by faith. You are surrounded by people. And when I enter into that rhythm and says, I'm going to be a part of that community, then I get that nudge daily. I get that, 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 that encouragement I need that says, I'm going to keep growing in my faith. So I have to look at, okay, who am I running with? Think of this. Who are you running with right now that's encouraging your faith? Let's add that to it. We run with a lot of different people. We hang out with a lot of different people. We do life with a lot of different people. But are we running with people that encourage us? Or do we run with people that stay away from us when we get stuck in life? Because there's some people that will be around us because of what we have, but then there's other people that will be around us that, that will slow us down. So if you look at the person that got stuck on the beach approach, if you are stuck in your race, guess what? You have no pace. You're stopped. If you're in, I mean, yesterday we went to the other side of town and, and I saw this like on my phone. I'm like, oh, it's red. And then I saw all of the stoplights and I'm like, the devil is a liar. Hello. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not doing 295. I'm doing Southside Boulevard. I'm like, I'm like, I've never like gone down Southside Boulevard in years and, and, and made it to the town center. Like, like in no time. Hello. I could have done what I could have got stuck in that track. Whenever you're stuck in, how many gets frustrated with traffic? Yeah, you're those people that drive in that other lane. You're that private lane. Are you those people? <sighs> Let's go on. Okay, so, so sometimes we, we, we get, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But, but when you're stuck in traffic, your pace is limited. But then, whew, when you're on the open highway, you have an opportunity to set the pace for your life. And for some of you, you need to live life well in the middle lane. You need to have that middle lane mentality. I'm telling you, there's a group of people in this world that have that middle lane mentality. They don't care how fast it's going in the other lane or how fast it's going in this lane. They're going as fast as they want to do in the middle lane. Hello? And they hang out in the middle lane. Hello? They don't, they don't get over on the right-hand side because that's just not a comfortable. They stand right in the middle and they set their pace and you get in the, and you, you're that person like you pass them on the right, you pass them on the left. You do everything you can. And you're like, like, get going. You're in the middle. Who's with me? Come on, clap. You're with me. Am I just talking to the wall? But when it comes to our spiritual life, sometimes we've got to realize it's okay to set the pace and go, okay, this is the pace. This is my race. These are the people that are around me. I'm going to keep moving in this direction. I need some pace setters in my life. The simple truth is who we run with is just as important as where we are running. Who you run with is just as important as where you are running. You need, some people are like, 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 how do I get involved in Ocean Way Church? Bo join a circle. Come every night this week, get to know somebody. How do I get connected to this house? I said this for, for six years now. Join a team. Really? Yeah, go to what's next, join a team, lean in. You will be connected, you'll find community. Don't sit on the outside and just say, well, I don't know if I can run with him. Guess what? If you got breath in your lungs, then you are qualified to serve. You are qualified to be a part of community. Come on, clap if you understand what I just said. Pace setters. These are people that set the pace in a race. If I want to live in the place where God is moving, then I have to ask myself, who's setting the pace for my life? Who is really setting the pace for my spiritual life? I have to look in the mirror sometimes and, and tell myself, you need, you're setting the pace. You need to pray a little bit more. You need to read more. You need to lean in more. You need to ask God to, to do more in your life. What would truly happen if we were more intentional about our pace? Not about our destination. I don't know anybody that, that's like, okay, I, I, I think we focus so hard sometimes on where we are going rather than the process of getting there. What if we just focus on our pace and say, I'm going to just start reading a little bit more. I'm going to start leaning in a little bit more. I'm going to start in involving myself a little bit more. I'm going to be a part of community. I'm going to be dangerous. I'm going to text 21 days to 904-751-0552. I'm going to let that pastor like send me a text seven more days. Hello? How inviting is that? Come on now. 
Some people are like, that's intrusive. No, that's my way of saying, let's go, giddy up. Come on, I want you to, to lean in. There's an enemy of your soul that knows that he cannot stop the, the race that you are running, but he can, he can distract you. He can throw everything he can to try to entangle you, to slow you down. I want to encourage you that he cannot slow heaven down. He can't slow the church down because Jesus said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. The church is still alive today, and you and I and every breathing person in this room online is a part of the church. Come on, who's a part of the church? Clap today if you are. So who are you running with? How much more would we see if God, uh, how much more would we see God move if we just pursued him more? So a fresh pace will simply give you a fresh race. That's why we do this. It's a jump start in the fall. And it's a jump start in the spring. If you're brand new to this church, you're like, you guys do this? I'm like, yes, we do this. We intentionally do this. Why? Because we believe that there are moments that God wants us to lean in. At the very beginning of the year, he wants us to lean in and listen to him speak to us. This is a strategic moment for you, your family, and the church. You might say, why? Because thousands of kids went to school just recently. And your whole life this summer was this. Everywhere. And now finally they're in school. Finally, there's a simple rhythm. Finally, you're like not on vacation. Finally, you're, you, can, you can slow down and lean in and say, okay, I'm gonna see God move. I've gotta be in a place where, where I check the pace that I'm running at. So a fresh pace is, is what will bring a fresh race. Then maybe just, maybe we need to ask ourselves, not just who we're running with, but how are we running? What, what's the, what, what's the, gate that we're running in? What's, what are we doing at, at, when it comes to running? We look in verse uh, one of Hebrews 12. He says, let us, that's all of us. Look at your neighbor and say us. Come on, tell him, say us. He's talking to us. Run with perseverance. That's a big word. The race that is marked out for us. The word perseverance there in the Greek is steadfast, endurance. This is a big one. Patience. So let us run with patience. When I am hungry and tired, I am the most impatient person on the planet. Hello? Who's with me? Come on. Who's with me? When you are hungry, like, like, like some of you come to the first experience because you're like, man, that other one will get into my lunchtime or whatever, my brunch time or whatever. And, and I'm just, some of you haven't eaten yet. And you're like, pastor, please stop talking about food. Hello. Cause I am going after this. I am going to consume whatever I can because fast is coming and I'm going to eat as much meat. I went and ate a burger yesterday. Hello. I'm like, let's get something red, juicy and amazing. So, so that's what I did. I don't know what you do, but, but when I'm hungry and, and I'm tired, I'm impatient when I, when I, when I, when I'm impatient. I have to look at my response sometimes and say, hold up. Here's why. If Paul told Timothy that he gave him a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind, if he gave him the spirit of self-discipline, then when it comes to patience, who's more, who, who has the power to, to, to focus and, and lean in discipline more than myself? There are other people that, that actually can, can build patience in my life. Why? Because they are trying. They are, they, they are, they are extra grace required people in this world. Hello? You, anybody know somebody like that? Come on now. They, like they make you impatient. Who's got somebody that makes you impatient? Come on now. All right, here we go. Uh, those are the people surround you. Identify those people. Then, then ask yourself, okay, um, what am I doing when I'm impatient? If we've ever get in a hurry and we find ourselves impatient. Now, now, when I'm driving, some people are really impatient when they drive. And when they're really impatient when they drive and they get in a, like, I, I watched this guy this morning. He didn't come here. So I was like, I'm going to talk about him. Like, like he kept like doing this, you know what I'm saying? And I'm just like going down, you know, coming down Cedar Point, coming down New Berlin. And I get right here where the lanes are too. And, and he's like four lanes and he's just like trying to like, choo, 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 choo. and then I look and he got to the light exact same time as everybody else. He was frustrated trying to get this lane, that lane, that lane, this lane. And, and, and sometimes when you see people behind you that do that, what do you do? You slow down. You know what I mean? You just kind of like stall those people. You know what I'm saying? That's really not a good thing to do, but it happens. You know what I'm saying? Because you see them around you and you're like, you're not getting past me because I am the gatekeeper of this fast lane and nobody needs to. Who's with, who does that? Come on now. Oh, I got you. There you go. And, and we're like, yes, I'm in control. Really? 
and you find yourself driving through those back roads and those neighborhoods trying to get around traffic and through traffic and everything like that. And those people that are in car lines, you know, school car lines, you're like, I'm going to jump in front of this person, that person. There are people that go to New Berlin Elementary. If you're here in this building, I God bless your soul. But I think school gets out at like 2.30 in the afternoon. I drive by at 1.30 in the afternoon. They're parked. They're in line. They're waiting. I'm like, man, that line must be long if you've got enough time to wait an hour unless they're doing their devotions. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, but when it comes to rush hour traffic, went through Orlando this week and man, the toll road is the express lanes, heaven on earth. Hello, who's been through that? I'm like, I don't care what it costs, Woo! through Orlando, hello? Then I come home and I'm like, wow, toll road, express lane, that's for me, sign me up. And I get in the express lane and I'm doing 70 and I think it's like 60, 65, I don't know. If you're a police officer, get over it. But um, I'm doing like 70. And I look over in the non-paid zone and these people are like, shoom, shoom, shoom. And I'm like, well, I just paid for that. I just paid to think I'm in an express lane. It cost me. And they're over there doing it for free. How frustrating is that? Hello? One day I'm going to be over here. You're going to be over there. And you're like, ah, praise the Lord. What? You, know what? you know what I'm exposing? My impatient behavior. So when I expose my impatient behavior, here's what happens. Whenever you're impatient, it always costs you something. Let, lean in. Come on now. This week, slow down. Don't get in a hurry. Enjoy the journey. Pick up a journal. Spend extra time in his presence. Slow down. Tell yourself, I need to slow down. Say this with me. Slow down. Lean in. Enjoy the journey. There's so much joy in God's presence. There's so much joy that he wants you to experience. But we are so impatient sometimes running our race, thinking we got to get to point A to point B. And life is complicated. I get it. We have kids. We have little kids. We have older kids. We have all kinds of kids. I have no kids in my house. Woo, I'm an empty nester. I'm not celebrating. I'm starting a circle for empty nesters that are going through the same pain. We're going to eat good food and talk about our kids. But, but here's the go. I'm thinking, you know, we, life is so complicated at times. We've got to really realize that the enemy wants us to focus on all the complicated layers of life. Why not focus on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith and find joy in just spending time with him? The enemy wants you to do this. Run, 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 run. Pastor wants you to slow down, enjoy the journey, celebrate some, look at God's word, write a little bit about God's word. If you've never done that, this is your week. This is the, at the end of these seven days, you will be refreshed by what? His presence. Your, your soul will be refreshed because you spent time with him. And when I spend time with him, then I start seeing where he's moving. When I, when I don't spend time with him, I get, I get frustrated. I get, I, I, I I've been here where, where I'm like, okay, Lord. I've prayed this prayer a hundred times. When are you going to move in this? You ever been there? It's a tough place to be sometimes. And sometimes God's like, I'm not operating on your timetable. Run your race. I didn't ask you to try to change heaven and earth. I didn't, you know, run your race. I'll move in it. Behind the scenes, he's moving. Behind the scenes, he's doing what I can't do. Behind the scenes, he wants me to, to have joy in what I'm doing and be motivated by, by him. So slow down this week. Be patient. Don't rush the journey. Enjoy the journey. I think that's a good word. Come on now. So how much more would we see God move if we had so much more joy that came out of being with him? See, you, you got to read the scripture. So, so. This is the last thing I want you to ask. The band will come here in a second, but um, a fresh pace for a fresh race may ask, we may have to ask this question. What is my motivation for running? Everyone has a motivation for everything. I have a motivation for losing weight because my doctor told me I was obese. Hello? I'm like, fat chance. Yes, I am. <laughs> He's like, you're BMI, your body. I don't give. Okay, let's go on. He said, no fried food, pastor. You need to cut your salt. I'm like, cut my what? Salt. I'm like, I don't put salt on my food. Then I looked at all my food and I'm like, boy, I eat a lot of salt. Hello? Why? Because my, my heart elevates all this other stuff and, and all these things compound these things. And, 
And, and what am I saying? I'm like, my motivation to lose weight is not to look good. My motivation to lose weight is to live. Here's why it's to live. He said, pastor, he said, have you ever done a heart, heart attack or risk thing? And I'm like, no, that's bad news. Who wants to, who wants, I, I, pastor, you want to do a stroke risk? And I, no, who wants to do that? You know what I'm saying? I want to eat fried chicken and ice cream. Hello, That's what I want to talk about. You know, what can I eat? Don't talk about what I can eat. What can I like consume in my life? And he's trying to, he's like, okay. And then, and then once he got through that, I'm like, okay, that changes my motive. I'm being real vulnerable. That changes my motivation for living. And it's not about, okay, I, I look good. It's about being here longer. It's about taking care of a family and kids and grandkids in the future. It's about pastoring a church long-term and saying, I want to be in longevity in a long place. I want to be where God wants me to be. Sometimes we have to make small, smart choices now that equate later, and the motivation is living. It's not looking. So when it comes to, understand this. Here's why I say that. When it comes to you doing the things that we call spiritual formation, reading, praying, worshiping, giving, serving, loving, all these things, those things have nothing to do with how you look. They have everything to do with how you live. Because Jesus didn't say, I'm going to come make you look good. Everyone wants to look good online. We put filters on. I don't know what this one is. I'm like all these faces people get. People make fun of me on, on social media. It's okay. I, I get it. Whatever. But, but I post pictures of food. That really annoys people. They get mad at what I eat. I'm just like, get over it. Okay. Um, but I will tell you this, that if all we are is focused on how we look, we'll miss the places where God wants us to live. Motivation. Jesus, or the writer Hebrews, verse 12 says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't have time to jump into all of this. So next week, we're gonna focus on one of these, this one verse. But I will tell you this, that there's two motivations that he talked about. The motivation of joy and the motivation of shame. Both of them are motivations in life. One will elevate, the other will decimate. Because we are so driven to be motivated that sometimes we allow people to shame us into our motivation. Understand this, the church is never in a position that we would ever put shame on anybody for not serving, not loving. If you tell us, hey, I just wanna serve once a month, praise the Lord, if that's where you wanna do it, we're with you, we wanna find a place for you because we want you to live at a higher level in every possible way. But the moment that we think we're, 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 we're bad people because we don't show up is the moment that we show up because we're shamed into it. Rather than consider this, Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, for the joy set before him, endured patiently the cross. He knew what was coming, but you read the verse, he knew where he was going. Sometimes we want to know what's coming and what's coming sometimes isn't always joyous. What does that tell me? In the midst of pain, I can still have joy. In the midst of struggle, I can still have joy. In the midst of heartache, I can have joy because joy makes me want to move. I think that the church ought to be the happiest place on the planet. I use that word happy in a loose way, but it ought to be the most living alive place on the planet. Because I believe that broken, messy, hurting, dropped, mistaken people who label them themselves those things belong here every single day. Because Jesus came to give us life and not just a little bit of life and not just show us life. He came to give us life. So if he came to give us life, then my greatest motivation for pursuing him 
and running him is the joy that I have, that I have a savior that sat down at the right hand of God. And one day he'll say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. That's where I want the church to be. That we serve well, that we love well, that we are motivated well. The joy is the greatest motivation. Why do we do the big give? Not so much that the community needs so much love, but so much that you need joy and love in serving and to understand that that's what living is all about. Why do we hold Sunday services? Because we have a joy in our heart that there's a savior on this planet that cares about our souls. You care about our soul? Come on now. Why do we have circles? Man, circles are the funnest spot of, of Ocean Way and they're growing. If you feel God's lead to lead one, show up at a at lunch today. They'll show you what it means to be a circle leader. I'm, I'm just praying that God will double the size of our circles because when he doubles the connection of our community, he starts doubling our, our, our spiritual impact in our own lives. We start seeing the church grow in our community. We wanna make a difference in this community on a level we've never seen before, but we have to be connected and, and what connects us is joy. This Wednesday night, our youth, youth department had almost 100 students. Come on, give God a hand. And they, like, Pastor Adam had to preach forever because there was this awful storm that was coming through Wednesday night. But then I, 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 I snuck out because I knew that they were doing this paint war thing. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to be near that. Hello, praise the Lord. I'm a little old for that. No, I'm just kidding. But they, when I watched their Instagram, when I watched it, I saw so much joy in our kids. Why do we do youth ministry? because this world wants to suck the life out of this generation, but we want to give them joy. We want to give them, per how do we do that? Jesus, the author, perfecter. I believe that when he perfects us, we have joy. When he authored us, he put joy in us. The, the joy that you wake up in the morning, you can have all these gross, crazy things happen in your life, all these layers, but guess what? You can have joy because you have a savior that's done what? He sits down at the right hand of the father. How many have a savior like that? Come on now. So it looks like next week we're going to have to break down the whole, the whole um, being motivated by shame thing because I just think there's so much that we need to break out of so that we can live in where God's called us to live. Have you got something good out of God's word today? Come on, clap if you have. So we're going to worship and we're going to sing a song. And, and um, I just believe that this is a moment where God can speak to you. I believe it's a moment where you can lean in and, and say, okay, Lord, we pray this simple prayer, Lord, where are you moving? How can I be a part of that? I would encourage you to pray that prayer. But maybe you're here today and you've not made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. You haven't made the simple decision to say, yes, I'll follow you. Jesus wants you to follow him, not follow me. He wants you to follow him. So we are here to lead you in a place where you can follow Christ and you can find out what living for him really means, that you can find community in this place. If you are separated from Christ, if you used to used to serve him and follow him years ago today what a great day just say lord i'm going to restart my relationship with you so that you can refresh my soul so that you can live in my soul so i'm going to pray in a moment i'm going to ask you to simply just wave at me because that's just a point of contact between you and me and when you make that decision guess what the bible says all heaven just jumps to its feet and rejoices because you said hey i want to follow jesus because that's why he came, to give life to the entire world, all of us in this place. He has a plan for your life. So I wanna pray for you. But as we worship in a moment, I wanna make this really clear that we open up these altars for miracles. We open up these altars for living. We open up these altars because we believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh within us, it says in Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. But we believe that when you take the moment to fill out whatever request you have, that it's that moment that we connect and we see God do greater. This week, we're gonna pray over these things. This week, we're gonna walk around and hold your prayer request. This week, we're gonna lean into God's presence and say, God, show up in ways we've never imagined. So during that worship time, I'd encourage you, come out, stop, drop your card here on the altar. If you wanna stand and just worship him around the front and, and let him speak to you, let him do that. If you need a miracle, just come and stay and say, God, I just wanna be where you are, closer to you. There's just something about moving. There's something about stepping into his presence. Something about walking towards him that, 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 that activates your faith. 
doesn't activate God's faith. God wants to heal you. God wants to provide. God wants to give you guidance. God has an answer for all these things. But, but some of us, just, we just need to start moving towards him and allow him to change everything. So Jesus, Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. God, I thank you for this house. I thank you, Lord, for the people that call this home and the people that are going to call this place home. I thank you, Lord, for for the growth that we're seeing in people's lives, God. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that in this moment, these next, this next week, as we look for your move and as we lean into your scriptures, God, as we, as we ask God you to, to do greater things, God, I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us. I pray, Lord, that the church would be more alive this week than it's ever been. God, I pray, Lord, that we pick up our journal, God. Lord, it's, it's not a, a duty that we do, but it's a joy that we take to say, Lord, I wanna be closer to you. If you're here today and you say, pastor, pray for me. I want to follow Jesus for the first time, or it's been a long time. Then, uh, when I say three, slip your hand up and wave at me. I want to pray with you right where you're sitting. You ready? One, two, three, slip it up. Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you in the back. Thank you. Anyone else want to be included in that? Go ahead. One, two, three, slip it up. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's pray together as a community of faith. Let's Let's say this prayer together with these that are making a decision to follow him. That prayer sounds like this. Jesus, Jesus today, today, I know I need a savior. I know I need you. Jesus, you died for my sins. You, died for my sins. you have a plan for my life. Forgive me of all my sins. All my sins. From, this on, From this moment on, I choose to follow you. I choose to follow you. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate with heaven. Come on, you can do better than that. Let's celebrate with heaven. That's joyous. Thank you for your support to Ocean Way Church. If you'd like to continue to give, you can visit OceanWayChurch.com for our five ways to give.